Okay. So welcome to How to Draw Raptors, the final class in our bird drawing fundamental series. And uh, today we are, or, sorry, John, could you put back the slide on the? Oh, I thought I was. So uh, right here we have our sort of collage of the uh, hashtag drawbirds2020 class submissions for how to draw water birds. Um, lots of beautiful, beautiful work. Um, and just a note before we get started today on how to draw raptors, uh, there have been a lot of requests about sort of presentation. Some people want to see John drawing more and some people want to see a reference image so that they can draw along more. And to make things better for everyone and for the recordings in the future, what we're going to do is we're going to have a sort of technique demonstration where John's drawing will be visible first and then we're going to focus on seeing the reference images. That way we get a little bit of everything for everyone and it should be better for the recordings. Um, and with that, I'll let John take it away. Welcome back, everybody. Today is our final workshop in this series on how to draw birds with the National Audubon Society. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we're focusing on drawing raptors. So we'll be looking at hawks and eagles. We're also going to be taking a really close look at drawing owls because there are some especially interesting things about their, their structure that if you understand those, it makes it a lot easier to get it down on your, your piece of paper. I'm really excited to see the volume and the, um, the, all the diversity of birds that, that people have been creating. The, we had a large number of, of, of egrets and ducks and herons that have been sketched and shared. And I hope that, uh, 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 Hamar, what is, what is our, our hashtag when people want to share their, their artwork? It's hashtag drawbirds2020. All right, hashtag, I'm gonna write that down. You might want it too. Um, drawbirds, drawbirds2020. And um, then we can see all the work that everybody is doing. Remember that drawing is, is really a numbers game. The more you do it, the better and better it gets. You do not need to spend 10,000 hours practicing doing this. It's going to come quickly, but you just have to start doing it on a regular basis. <clears throat> this class is a great launching point for starting a routine of regularly sketching and drawing. And if you start uh, if you if you do that, you're going to see a huge change in your ability to draw what you see and also to understand and appreciate birds. This process of drawing birds is going to help you slow down and look and look again and look again at all the things that you that you otherwise would would miss. And so I. I, I just want to encourage everybody to, to start sketching as a, as a part of your bird watching process, For, whether that's the little birds that are right there in your backyard um, or drawing from, from, from reference material photographs, or if you have an opportunity to go to an open space and see real birds, if you start drawing as you are, as you're birding, You'll see more, you'll remember more. And also, interestingly enough, drawing gets you to focus on the kinds of details that the really high-end birders, you know, the sort of magical birders who can kind of walk around and, you know, there's some distant silhouette of some speck of thing. And they're like, oh yeah, that's a says Phoebe. And like, how did you, like, you cannot see any of the, the field marks from this distance. How do they do that? They're looking at sorts of things like postures and proportions and, and <clears throat> that's what you're training yourself to do as you're sketching. So you're training your brain to pick up these really subtle clues that, that are going to make a difference for you being able to, uh, to, to become a master birder yourself and as well as to draw what you see. So today it's birds of prey. And we're going to start off with a little bit of 
just bird drawing practice. And I'm going to be uh, doing a little demonstration about my approach for drawing raptors. And you'll see it's essentially the same as we've been doing with everything else. A little bit later in this class, we'll get into some specific nuances that are going to um, that we can we can add to it, but I'm going to put a uh, I'll be putting up a slide and we're all going to be doing just some quick drawings just to warm us up before we do that just here is a reminder with a raptor example of how how we can go about Here we go Here is the sketch cam so I usually start a drawing with a very, very light, non-photo blue pencil. I think I showed those in a previous workshop. Um, usually my, my drawings start with this Prismacolor Cole Erase non-photo blue pencil. When I draw with this, It makes these really faint lines. And right now you're thinking, I can't see your really faint lines. That's right, but here's the cool thing, I can. I can with this pencil, I can see exactly where I'm going. When I draw on top of this sketch, nobody's gonna notice those little ghosty lines. And so then I can get in there and draw um, a more precise, careful lines with a regular pencil, but but when I'm blocking things in, I love using this. There are other non-photo blue pencils. There are other, um, you know, light pencils. This one is my favorite because this, this color blue in combination with how ghosty this mark is. I mean, other, other non-photo blue pencils will make bold marks that all of you can see. Zoom in. All right. So this is with the non with with the one that I usually use. This is with a regular pencil. So you can see that regular pencil one. Um, so I'm not going to be doing my demonstrations with the pencil that I usually use. That might be confusing for somebody like, why aren't you using your favorite non-photo blue pencil? It's because you can't see it in the demonstrations. It works so well, you can't see it. So um, when I'm drawing raptors. It's going to be the same thing. I'm first going to pay attention to that, that angle right down the back. And then block in a head. Now remember, we're going to be looking at raptors, um, some big raptors. And so generally speaking, big birds have small little heads. Um, so get ready for some proportionately smaller heads. And then I get that angle that you see right around the chest. So this negative shape here in the back, this negative shape in the front, and then I put in a ball of a body to say your, your body's about this big relative to um, the, uh, relative to your head. That's, that's the big proportion thing. How big is that head compared to that body? Um, I like to put in the leading edge of the wing, the tail. And sometimes for the tail, I'll just draw a line out and then somewhere along that I'll go, I'm gonna trim it right here. So a little tick mark along that tail to help me know when to stop. And with the songbirds, here we're, we're sticking in a leg. Um, on the, uh, the, the upper parts of the bird's uh, leg are often covered with shaggy feathers in birds of prey. So I can get that little kind of wear down the belly. Does that, does that sort of shag start? And then their foot will come out of that. So I'm going to do one more, um, one more little demonstration. Oh, and, and then actually just, why don't we do, why don't we do this? Once I have this, <clears throat> that's when I would then start 
to come in and slowly, let's I'll use that one, let's use this one. Now, this part of the drawing, you're creating your, your final lines. Your, this is the part of the drawing that everybody sees. But I can draw that more confidently because I've already really worked out a lot of the my big questions of how big is this part I don't have to worry about where in my drawing should that wing go because I, I can now just focus on the shape of that wing as opposed to where does it go on that whole body So general shape first, then I come in on top of that with uh, more deliberate, careful lines. We're going to try one more here. <clears throat> this time an owl. And just starting with what is that negative shape off the back? Give myself a ball for a head. Owls crazy proportions on those big old heads. All right, so back, head, back. John, could you move the page oh, up or the yes, camera? Yes, thank you. So that would be how I would block in sort of getting those, those, those first lines for another little beastie. All right. So um, let's now jump to the screen share here. And we are... All right, so we are going to, um, well, let's just dive into our first bird. So everybody just on your own piece of paper, let's block in the basic shape of this bird. Basic shape of the bird, let's do that now. I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds here. Again, the reason I'm not uh, giving you a lot of enough time to finish any of these drawings is because I really want people to focus on blocking in those basic shapes, drawing quickly. If we just leave a bird up here, you can do that anytime you want, but uh, with, with birds that you're looking at from photographs online. But here, Let's, uh, we're going to be kind of cycling through a number of different pictures. Loosen up and get these shapes down more quickly. Now notice the speed at which your hand has been drawing. On this next one, what you're going to do is to double your drawing speed. That's right. And I'm watching you. 
So what I want you to do is um, to, to, to draw as quickly and fluidly as you can. Are you ready? So here you're not worried about accuracy. Let's just go for raw drawing speed. On your mark, get set, and let's go. This is a northern hawk owl. It's a, 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 an owl that didn't really get the memo about kind of being active and hunting at night. They often hunt during the day. John, while people are drawing, is there any way that you could get rid of that little top part of the screen that's being shared? People are commenting on it being obtrusive. Um, this, this thing that says new share, pause share, annotate, are you guys seeing that too? Yeah. Um, I imagine there is, but I don't know how to do that. Hide floating meeting controls. <laughs> Yes, there is. Thank you. So if you're still actually blocking in the basic shape, you're drawing too slow. You should have, about this point, have gotten that thing down. Again, it's fast, it's loose. <laughs> Angle, head, angle, body. Stick in a tail. Let's do the same thing. First, let's play pat the bird, all right? Pat the bird. We're gonna pat the Merlin. So put your hand on the top of its head and feel that bump, feel the curve coming down and out the wings. All the way, feel that line, pat the bird. Physically, your hand moving through the air. Up, down, notice where the inflection point is in that curve of the back. You can actually do that almost with a straight line. Up to this corner, shoop, then down to here. All right. It, when you start drawing curves, your brain loses things like inflection points. So I'll often chisel these in like a sculptor. All right, let's get this one. You've got one minute for this bird. And if you finish your first basic lines, you can start anywhere on the drawing that is of interest to you and start to draw in some details. But I recommend before you do that to just stop and ju double check your proportions. Did you make the head too big, the head too small? Do you wanna change the angle of something? Because this drawing, your drawing is completely plastic. All right, that's, that's been a whole minute now. So <laughs> pencils down. Um, Let's take a look at your, the, 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 the thing that you blocked in and assume that there are some places where it is inaccurate, all right? Assume that there are places in it where you didn't capture an angle or you made your head stick way too far out. You need to bring that back in closer towards the body. Um, if you look at it, not to kind of beat up on yourself like, oh, where did I make a mistake? But I actually look at mine going, where is this not accurate? And that gives me a better chance of spotting those places than if I look at my drawing to make sure I got it right, my brain will often tell me, you're fine, you're fine, everything's okay. Yes, you got it right. But if I Go like, how are my proportions? How are my negative shapes? Did I capture those accurately? And look at it with expecting to see something different. Very often, 
Most of the time, I catch something that needs to be tweaked a little bit. So let's start just with negative shapes. Don't look at the bird. Look at the, angle, the angles in the air back here. Look at the angle in the air right here. See that negative shape? Right? Carve that into your drawing. Shoop, shoop. Look at this negative shape coming straight down here to an inflection point, then coming back here and curving down like that. So there's maybe a C curve here to a straight line up to the throat. That's a negative shape. Look at the shape of the air, not the bird, the air. You see that in the air? If that's not on your drawing, carve that in right now just by pressing a little bit more forcefully with your pencil. Look at this wonderful negative space, up, over, and back. One, two, three, three angles there. This negative shape, so good. Did you make the legs too long? Right. Very often people do these kinds of checks at the end of a drawing and they realize, oh, I made my legs too long. Oh, my body is too long, too hot dog-like. It's not, this is, should be a little bit more of a compact body. And they realize there's something fundamentally off with some of these proportions. At that point, there is nothing that you can do about it but weep. But if you catch it at the start of the drawing, the start of a drawing is completely plastic, completely plastic. You are not wedded to any of the marks that you put down. That's why we're making them fast, light, and loose. If you make bold, slow, deliberate, detailed lines, your brain will lock into those and say, yes, it's fine, don't worry about it, and you won't notice that something is off until well, until your picture is done. And then you're trying to go, and then you kind of back up from it. And you go like, whoa, I made the head too big again. All right, so once you block in your bird, on this next one, we're gonna block in our bird, then stop, you're gonna breathe, and you're gonna check for those angles, those proportions, how big is this compared to this? Is this in the right place compared to that? You're gonna, the negative shapes will help you, All right? Let's try it with this bird right here. So now stop and look at the angles around it. Are there any angles that you want to kind of carve in, reinforce more? Things that want to be corrected. Things that you can change. If you can spot at least one thing worthy of being changed at this early point in the drawing, you have saved yourself a massive amount of headache later on. Mm. Now, we're not going to get lost in all this detail. Don't get lost drawing the eye, the markings on the face, all that sort of stuff. Start by just looking, let's pat the bird again, right? <clears throat> this comes over and down, over at an angle and down, and then out. So two verticals, three horizontals. Look at the direction that that is pointing. Is that the same as that? That angle, that angle, that angle, right? That's our kind of slope of the back. How 
drop in a fairly big head here. Small bird. The American kestrel is a small bird. Nice angle there. Let's drop that in. You might want to zoom out a little bit on the document cam just because a little bit of it is getting cut off too. Actually, I, I'm going to do this over here because I don't want people watching my document camera. Um, I, I, I thought that I was off camera there and I didn't want, I want people actually looking at the bird there, not my, my, my paper. So, so I'm going to bogart my sketch pad. Being willing to change your mind about a mark that you have is very, very, very powerful. Don't worry about getting it right the first time. Get some marks down on paper, and then you're going to have an opportunity to change your mind about what you see. All right, um, so what I'm gonna do is just back up through some of these birds and introduce one more kind of drawing strategy into, into these, these birds here. This, for something like this, um, bald eagle that is in a straight up profile position, that is, um, you know, we, 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 our approach is, is really useful to, to doing that. But when something is in a, what we call a three quarter view, where it's not the front view, it's not the side view, you're somewhere in between those. There's another set of lines that is really, really useful. And so what I envision is a line wrapping around the top of the head here, coming down right the middle of its head, right through the middle of its beak, and then I imagine where would the center of your belly be? We're going to see that a lot of birds of prey have in their lower belly two big clumps of feathers. There's often a little bit of a groove, which we're seeing right here. So the middle of the belly is actually coming up here and around like that. Another useful line is coming through the eye and out the other side. And because this is a round object, I want to imagine this as a curved line coming down here and coming up here. So I've got this curve, I have this curved line wrapping around the head, and then there's another curved line wrapping around the middle of the tummy. The head ones don't have to line up with the belly ones. So if I were, um, I'm gonna jump back to the document camera, All right, so for, for that little owl, I find it's really useful to think of the, the line kind of wrapping around the head, right? Sort of there's that line coming, wrapping around the head and then wrapping the eye line, wrapping around this way. Now, those two lines are going to help orient my head. Now, there's the belly, and we're not looking at the side of the belly. We're looking, the middle of the belly is gonna be a curved line somewhere off in here. 
So imagine these as you have a, if you've got a ball, you are wrapping a curve like a crescent moon around that. And then you can put another crescent. If it looks straight towards you, what you're seeing is that. It's just seeing crosshairs right through the middle of it. But the minute that turns over to the side, then you've got a crescent moon shape and a crescent. So that's, that's what I've got going on on the face of this bird here. Um, for, for that little owl that was up on, a, on the branch, I am thinking of a line coming through the middle of its head. And I don't have to draw the whole way, so I don't have to draw it going all the way around like that. And then so that means that you know, here's it's looking this way, slightly looking out that way. And then here is the middle of the belly coming down here. So those orientation lines you're going to, uh, are going to be very, very helpful for us when we're moving a bird head around. Um, so if I have So if I have a ball, right, and I rotate that off to the side, do you see how it made a crescent? All right, if I have a ball with crosshairs on it, if it looks up, the bottom one is straight, and then there's a crescent. It looks over to the side. It's now a crescent and a crescent. Your daughter's modeling clay becomes very useful as sort of just, just visualizing these lines. Um, if you're kind of looking for a great exercise to do, just drawing in spheres and hold a little ball in front of you and see what, what your crosshairs do from that angle. Those, those angles are gonna be really wonderful in helping orient the, the heads of your birds. Um, the three quarter view angle is what you are going to see. <clears throat> just, just imagine that there's, you know, here's your bird, and here's you looking at the bird. Um, if it's looking straight at you, and or straight over to the side, right? Very often people will have a handle on how I can handle this view and how I can handle this view. But if the bird is oriented anywhere else, what people will often do is draw it as if you're looking at it from the front or from the side. But look at how more likely you are to see a bird in one of these poses than this or this. So this handling, some strategies for handling the three quarter view angles, this is going to allow you to draw birds in the pose that you are seeing them the most often. Um, so when you're out drawing in nature, um, this is going to be a much more kind of getting comfortable with, with drawing these things from some three quarter view angles. It's really gonna help you. Um, when you look at photographs, you're gonna find that photographs are biased towards owls looking straight at you and um, 
other birds just in the profile. So you see the hook of the beak. So there's a bias in photographs from, from front and side, but in nature, you're gonna see most often all these other angles. So that's why having a little bit of, um, uh, having a, a, a handle on drawing those, you know, how would you approach doing that is going to be very, very helpful. We've already talked a little bit about, hold on, I need to hide these, hide floating meeting controls. There we are. There. <clears throat> All right, um, so here I have three, these body ovals are the same size. This head, this head, and this head, big, medium, small, those are the proportions of heads. That This might be a kestrel, this might be a red-tailed hawk, and this might be uh, an eagle, a golden eagle. So you'll see the larger the bird, the smaller the head becomes proportionately. So don't think big bird, big head, big bird, small head. Proportions, we get those at the very start of our program um, of, of, of getting the, the bird on paper. So if at the start you're so excited about drawing a beak that you don't slow down and really get those proportions, you'll end up drawing a kestrel with the proportions of a red-tailed hawk and something won't feel right. And you won't be able to really kind of come up, it's not until you come up for air at the end of the drawing that you'll be able to pick that out. So paying attention to that head to body proportion is really important at the, the start of a drawing. When we, get into the drawing, when we get into a drawing, there are, and we've, we've got that, that those, those bits blocked out, there are some details that you can see on the bird's body that are going to be helpful for us to, to get. The birds have, uh, birds of prey have the same very similar feather patterns than, uh, to, to what we've seen in songbirds and things, but there's a couple of little differences. Um, if you remember from the previous class, we had the primary feathers and secondary feathers and then covert feathers. The same is true here, but the proportions of these get really interesting. Generally with a a uh, beautio, like a red-tailed hawk, you're going to have, think of the wing as a big box. Here's my secondary feathers as a big boxy thing. And the, you're gonna go from secondary feathers into the secondary coverts, and there's a whole bunch of rows of those. So before we had, we sort of could see uh, sometimes two, maybe three rows of feathers, the littler feathers at the top of the wing make lots of little rows here. Um, most of these starting uh, up, up in the, 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 the wing area towards the, uh, the, sorry, the wrist area, overlapping from front to back are secondary feathers and the first row of coverts flips that. So here's one, two, three, whole pile the same length, that's my secondaries. So essentially I've got a big box here and my primary feathers tuck underneath that. And the primary feathers, when it bends its wrist here, it can tuck those way back so you see a big shelf of wing with the primaries sticking out partway through that, or they can also be closer to the front edge. So they could be coming, the primaries could be coming out here, they could be coming out here, they could be coming out here. The angle of those, though, wants to point back up here 
towards where the bird's wrist is. So I have all those different places for my primaries to tuck. Different species of birds, the parts of the wings are going to be different shapes. On long winged fast flying birds, like falcons, you're going to see that the secondary feathers get really short. I have one, two, three, and instead of whole pile of same length, first of all, those three are short. Look at this, these are long, these are short. There's only one, two, three. And then these ones even reshorten in here. So tiny here in secondaries. And then the primaries are long sticking way out. So I'm often looking at, wow, that's short. How long is this compared to the tail? Here, those are about the same length. So my primary feathers can be very long. These are fairly long also, but because the secondaries are so big, you don't really see that long an extension sticking out behind them. So then going up before, we thought of sort of big, a row of, set of, of coverts, and then a medium and then smaller. So these, you have a big row, and then you're getting into just a whole bunch of rows of smaller covert feathers, almost all overlapping from front to back. These ones down here, the first covert row and the secondaries and the primaries overlapping in the opposite direction. So there's a switch there. The other big thing that which we need to notice here is this big pad of feathers up here. This is a really big deal. This in um, songbirds was a small little detail. These are the scapular feathers. And scapular because they go over the bird's shoulder blade, which is <clears throat> underneath the feathers in here and in here. And what we're seeing is usually two to three really big rows of very large feathers. I mean, this one here, I mean, look at how big those get out at the tip. And that makes a big pile pointing towards the middle of the bird's back in a V. If you are looking at red-tailed hawks, one great way to tell a red-tailed hawk from the back is in their scapular feathers, they often have a whole bunch of white modeling in here. And when you look at them from the back, you see this white V. So scapular feathers on birds of prey end up being something that we really have to pay attention to. So here we have those scapular feathers. That is, and there's a small wedge of back between them. And here I see the scapular feathers coming over from the other side of this bird. This is a new thing for us to pay attention to on the backs of our birds. Let's pay attention to the wing for a second. What feathers are these? What feathers are these? Oh, not you. And what about these? If you're here in the first class, um, where we kind of really carefully went through all the parts of the wing, this is a review. If you weren't in that class, um, it is, there's a video of it, and we really spent some time dialing in understanding of these different sections of the wings where we learned the primary feathers, the secondary feathers, the secondary coverts. Here is the greater secondary coverts, the median, the lesser secondary coverts. And then this little pad of feathers out here, that is my allula. If you weren't in that class, don't worry about it for now. Um, I'm about to jump over to the, uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing, and I'm going to go to this camera here. I'm going to show um, just a, a way of simplifying thinking about all of that. Uh, let's go one step closer. There we are.
So I'm going to draw a bird here. And it's going to be looking towards me, but it's looking over its shoulder. So here is the center line down the middle of its back. On the back, <clears throat> there's that pad of feathers in the middle of the back that makes a little triangle with the scapulars on either side of it. So my scapulars are going to come down here and make a V. If I'm drawing a red-tailed hawk, these scapular feathers in there are going to um, have lots of little white markings in them. Now this wing here, look at how I simplify it. I'm going to draw an oval. Here's an oval. So there's, that's the box of my secondary feathers. Kind of goes up to more of a pointed wrist corner here. and then back down here. And I can have the, 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 the primaries could stick out here. The primaries could also be tucked back here. That's what I'm gonna do on this one. I'm gonna have the primaries come here so that they are gonna be over, completely overlapped. I'm gonna have my secondaries in here and then up in here is just going to be all sorts of rows of coverts. Actually, I'll make these secondaries a little bit longer. And this is a strategy I use a lot when I'm drawing the back of a bird. I'm going to zoom in one more step and try to keep my bird centered. Check this out. If this is the line along the top of my back, and this is the line along the base of the scapulars, see how those are parallel? Now, this is going to be the line along, parallel with that, along the base of the secondaries. So that means that this wad of secondary feathers is going to come down to there. Hey, John, so the video is coming through a little bit blurry, and it might help if you just make the lines a little more bold, because I think... Ah. Yeah. Yeah, I think what's, what's blurry is I'm using a very blunt pencil. And so it's making rather broad lines. Um, and then here's the tip of my primaries. So this one is going to come down to here. And parallel with that. Here's the base of that tail. Those parallel guides help me block in So take home points here. I have a center line. There is a V of my scapular feathers. This zone is my scapular feathers. I have a block of a wing that's going to come down here. And uh, if I want to get in there and draw in feathers, I can. So this would be 
one, two, three, whole pile the same length of secondaries coming in there. This would be um, and it's it's useful to to kind of be able to kind of know what these these feathers are are, are doing in here. But most raptors that you're looking at out there, you're not seeing the 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 detail of of you know feather by feather by feather what is happening with the overlap you're seeing this distant shape if the bird is really cooperative and it's really close and like you know a captive bird and you can sit with it there in front of you um you'll be able to kind of get in all that wing detail most often in a field sketch i'm not getting all that information so don't feel bad if you can't get um you know all that you know you know what you know what does the feather do over here you know can i see this one i can't even see that on my the bird that i'm looking at there the tree then i would say you, know, you can't see it on the real bird don't draw it um leave out what you don't see but here I just wanted to do this to help you sort of see how all these elements come into play and the power of kind of being able to look for those scapulars. It will tie your wing into the bird. Um, and wings become very confusing if you don't, on, on raptors, if you don't, um, if you don't understand those scapulars. floating screen controls. All right. Uh, here you see that center line coming down on that bird over there as well. So <clears throat> look at this. What is this? That's that little zone between the scapular feathers. What is this patch of red feathers? Take a look here. Well, first we know the wing, right? We know these feathers, the primaries. Here's one, two, three, whole pile of small little secondaries. So then these are, there's the wing, that whole blue area. Those are the secondaries and secondary coverts. But what's that? You guessed it. And notice also that you are not underscore not seeing the edges of all of these feathers. All right, so don't draw in things that because you know that like these should be, these ones will be on top of these ones and draw in all the edges of the feathers. You are, if we're not seeing that, then we don't draw it. So let's take a moment with this bird and we, we've done a quick sketch of it before. Let's do a new quick sketch of it. But this time, what I want you to do is put in that center line through the face, that eye line through here, right? And so your beak is gonna be centered where the cross hairs are coming over here. And draw a line down the middle of the back, block in a bunch of scapulars as ovals on either side of that. Just here's this patch of scapulars, here's this patch of scapulars, here is my wing. So let's just take a couple of minutes with this, and I'm intentionally moving my pad out of your line of sight because this is the point where you're drawing. Start with those negative shapes. Um, 
I'm going to show you my, can you see my, uh, let me go, I'll jump over to my document camera and I'm going to show you how I approached it. There we are. Um, here's, what's my little bird. And what I was thinking as I was doing this was uh, one I saw the kind of head came down here. There's a little bit of bump where I had this back here. I saw some scapular here. I saw some zone of scapulars that was up in here. The wings, the wings drooped down. Could you shift it a little to the left? The wings drooped down and swooped back. I had secondaries that were in here. Primaries that were in there. The wing on the other side, actually this was all, this was poofing up here. The, I really didn't see much of the wings on the other side, but I saw a kind of a bump made by the scapulars of those wings on the other side. So you can see that those scapulars really help kind of attach those, those, those wings into, into the body. Let's take a closer look at the head of a raptor. Am I still on document camera or am I screen sharing? You're on document camera. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hard. All right. So um, when you're looking at the head of a raptor, they have a bony ridge above their eye um, in most species. Uh, we'll show you kind of an exception to that in a moment. It kind of gives them this angry birds look. So the reason that, that raptors kind of look like they're upset about something, they have this bony ridge that gives them a little bit of a sun visor. The beak is this cool down hook thing. Uh, there's a little bit of a bump and then the corner of the mouth traces back um, towards the eye. The amount that it comes back is going to be different in different species. This is sort of a typical red tail arrangement. If you're looking at something like a phrygianus hawk, their gape is all the way back here and it makes them have, the, makes them have this very long mouthed look. There's a little bit of stiff bristling at the base of the, the bill, and we'll see this getting even more extreme when we get to owls. And there's a pad of tissue that can be brightly colored, um, same color as this kind of gape on the mouth here, um, that is the, the, the sear, called the sear, that is right up here um, between the feathers and the dark part of the beak. So you often have a different color zone coming right in here, beak coming down and back here. The eye is set higher in the head than the corner of the mouth. So with, with songbirds, we're often putting the eye down lower. It's gonna be a little bit higher in the head at like in say a duck. Um, so high eye with shadow, and then these parts of the beak, the front hook part, there's the sear, and then the gape that comes back. A good way to suggest this ridge is when you are drawing in your eye, is to put a shadow going from the front corner of the eye here out straight out this way. That's better than drawing a little line in 
little line, sometimes like people think you're drawing an eyebrow, that shadow, which is really kind of closer to what you're going to see, is a very effective way of doing that. So a shadow kind of coming off the top of the eye. Notice that there's this big bristly zone. Here's our sear, the gape of the mouth, and that hook down. Really cool beaks on these things. Really, really cool beaks. Here's the danger. Really, really cool beaks on these things. And the reason that that's a danger is that very often we will exaggerate the parts of a drawing that are the most interesting to us. So if we are really into that beak, what people will do is draw a beak that is way, way, way too big. And it's not, it's just sort of a subconscious thing. Your brain is going, whoa, check out that beak. And so you put this huge toucan thing on the side of your raptor. Some raptors like a, um, uh, a bald eagle have massive beaks. A stellar sea eagle has a ridiculously large beak. Um, but on most of them, it's not as big as, as we would think. You get to falcons and things, the beaks actually get fairly petite. A cooper's hawk, a sharp shinned hawk, very small diminutive beaks. But because the beak is cool, be aware that there's a tendency to overdo it. If you're looking at it from the front, you see that kind of ridge of the eyes. And so the eye and the top of the beak and the eye are going to be in line. Where it's, the beak is making sort of a cross shape, wider in the center, going down to a little point. Think for a moment how you might suggest that. Notice this negative space in here. And also notice that the edge of the head right here below the eye, it's gonna poof out a little bit. You see that there, you see that there, all right? So putting all these things together, um, you have kind of a cross, um, here's my, my guidelines. My eyes are often more in line with the top of the beak. If they have that brow, it gives them this angry bird's look. And the amount that it sticks out on either side is gonna be different in different species. So a little small build um, Merlin here. Um, this a kite, kind of nice angry, angry look there. If you look at it from a three quarter view, you don't get to see the other eye. And this is, here's the important detail. Look at how the beak tucks up into, you see a little bit of the head feathers coming down on this side here. And you see that coming in over here, All right? That is going to make your beak look like you're seeing it from a three quarter view instead of um, just a straight side view. So that little bit coming in there makes a big, big, big difference. I'm now going to switch over to the document camera again, and we're going to look at some raptor heads. And we're gonna do just a kind of a quick diagram of, of front side, sorry, side front and three quarter view. So if I'm looking at it from the side, I have my ball of my head and my beak 
is going to stick on the side of that. Bird artist Keith Hansen has a great technique. He, he knows that once he starts drawing that cool beak, he's going to overdo it. So when he's just placing his beak, he just puts a little ball there. And all he's thinking about as he puts that little kind of nose on the bird um, is how big that should be. So he's really paying attention to the proportions as he just draws a little ball. There's my beak, right? And this drawing it in as a little ball helps you think about those proportions. Then you do this, and uh, it's starting to look a little bit more raptory. Right. So I'm going to come in straight from the bottom. I'm going to come in curve from the top. The mouth line is going back in here. In this area, I have that little nostril and the sear. My eye is going to be in line with this, but I want to make leave room in here for that wonderful little um, all those so that that bristly area. To make it look raptory, I put a shadow right in there. You put in that shadow, it looks much more, much more raptor. The feathers come up a little bit on the underside of the head. I'm going to give this bird a, a head trim here. And if you were here for a previous class, we learned about ear patches. These guys also have a little ear patch. There's a little ear patch that kind of sticks back there. If I am doing this bird from the front, then I am putting in my oval. I have my crosshairs. And a line, so, and then my, my beak is going to be big going to small. So I put in a little oval with a point on the bottom of it. And then coming off the bottom of that are going to be those, those little wings of the corner of the mouth. The eye, I want to leave enough room. So I look at the negative space between the beak and the eye. And my eyes will go in here. And the head gets wider. So as I start to draw those in, and if I add some shadows in here, then it starts to look kind of angry. I have my beak is as a point down in the front and then it comes out to the sides. And on the top of my head, it 
it pooches out a little bit when you get to, it's kind of has the little orphan Annie look. <laughs> I need to put in some eyeballs. You're going to have your bird's throat coming down here. And lastly, if we get a three-quarter view, and this is, this is the one that I, I think is really worth us paying attention to. Here is the center line down the middle of that head. The beak is going to be in this area here. And I'm going to try not to overdo the beak. You still see that it has a curve in the three-quarter view. You need room for the, uh, those, those bristles and then your eye. So watch, watch this. I'm first going to do the beak wrong. All right. So on the beak, there's that, the sear, there's, uh, which is that, that, that piece that has the nostril in it. There's the gape of the mouth. Here is my shadow. So look at if the side of the head comes up like this. You kind of get the sense that you're looking at the side of the bird's head. But the minute I do, watch this little change. I'm going to zoom in here. This is the, oops, that's not zoom. All right, so watch this. Oh, there we go. Watch this little change. All right, so I've got this part coming in. And here we're going to be wrapping around. And then on the other side, okay. So the center of the bird's head is going to be in here. So do you see how I just put in this zone here? And then that beak is fitting into, into the head. That does a lot to turn that head. So side, you don't get that three-quarter you do. Right. So here is a, a bald eagle. You can see this really does have a massive beak. And notice that it is, you can see right there, 
look where that far side just tucks over and that beak comes in. That just turns that head a little bit towards you. Nice shadow here. Shadow better than a line, right? But that little detail in there sticks that beak into that head. Here's the center line of the back going down right here. You see that top little triangle of back feathers. And on either side, these massive scapular feathers. Block, rectangular block sticking down of secondary feathers with primaries there. Rectangular block of wing feathers coming down just like that. The primaries here hiding into the tail. Primaries, secondary feathers, covert feathers, and here are the smaller covert feathers. The first layer of covert feathers on this kite is, um, white-tailed kite is uh, right here and it's gray. The black shoulder on it is all the rest of the covert feathers. And what are these large feathers? Now you know. Let's look at what happens here. So to draw this head, the two critical things would be number one, I would get this far side of the head wrapping around this side of the beak. And then also notice here's this little brow ridge. Look right over there. That angle change there is the brow ridge on the other side. So getting this to look raptory, you draw your eye with your shadow in here, tuck this side of the head, and then cut in at a corner here, and it will, you'll get that brow ridge on the other side. So look often on the far side of the head in here for really cool angles. Really cool angles. Just for comparison, oh, here's that cool angle. Like here's this brow ridge. Trace that over here. Here's that brow ridge. So you want that to come out here. The beak tucks in and we have that brow ridge poking out on the other side. Notice on the falcon how much smaller the beak is. This is a peregrine falcon. And you think, oh, magnificent bird of prey. Give it a big toucan beak. No, no, I'm a falcon. I've got a little petite beak and I will use that quite effectively, thank you very much. All right, beak tucking in, far side of the head. So just being able to do that, you can get really neat, just subtle turns of the head in the critters that you're drawing. Here's that tuck in. Get that shadow here. Squint at the screen for a moment. When you squint, it's often easier to see contrast. And you'll see that big dark shadow zone in there. Pop that in and you will have a much more effective raptor head. Let's just take a moment and everybody draw this raptor's head. I'm intentionally not drawing this on screen. I want everybody doing this on their own.
Now, if you're looking at a photograph that has been taken in a zoo, something that you'll often see are ridiculously large hooks on the raptor's beaks because they don't, they actually need to get in there on a regular basis and kind of file them down. On a wild bird that's kind of bumping against all of nature, you'll find that, um, uh, that, that they often have a, less of a hook. But if you're looking at a new animal, which this isn't, um, you'll see really these things coming just down, kind of just, it looks like, you know, some Hawaiian uh, nectar feeding beastie. This is a red tail hawk. Are we able to kind of tuck that beak in there? The strategies are very useful. I made my eye much too small. tend to make my eyes too big. So I'm fighting against that and here I overcompensated. Oh, now I made it too big. Well, there you go. Now, there is one exception to our kind of cool angry birds brow ridge. When you look at an osprey, they, they often just kind of, unless you're a fish, they look sweet. They just like, you know, they have this kind of surprised expression. <laughs> they, uh, like, I, I, I uh, golly, uh, you know, this not surprised, this, you know, surprised. So what's going on here in the osprey is that they don't have that brow ridge. And so it don't, they don't have that really kind of cool, angry birds thing. Right here, you see that nice prominent brow ridge and proportionately small bill on this Cooper's hawk. Crazy brow ridge. Right. So that's something that's gonna give your birds much more of the expression. Love this head wrap around here. This tucks in, that wraps around. There's that, look at that corner. Nice corner. But this guy just looks kind of golly. Kind of like, like goggle eye, not very intimidating. Um, still, uh, the uh, fish are very impressed by this osprey. And then this live gives us a little time for owls. When we're looking at owls, very often you are seeing them in poor lighting conditions, um, maybe a distance away. If that's the case, um, I just draw in my sketch the amount of detail that I can see in this place real time. So if this is the view you have of the owl, don't expect to kind of get in there and sort of have a sketch with all of its nasal bristles, right? Um, but if you do get a closer look at an owl, then you can get in even more information. If you are drawing from photographs, you can also do the same thing. It's great to practice with photographs and practice with animals in captivity um, so that when you do encounter them in the field, you'll have a better understanding of their structure to be able to, to help you get that down. Uh, as we all know, the head is on a pivot. So take a look at this head here. See where the brown is? That is the line along which the head swivels. So here is the back of the head. 
Here is the back of the head. And you can see how just this trimmed along. This whole unit up here spins. They can't spin all the way around, but they can go most of the way around. All right, you see that pivoting back here. <clears throat> so you want to think this, think of this as one unit, the body as another unit and there will be a fairly crisp um, change along the side of the body. Another thing to notice about owls is that neck zone, in the past we thought of our head, um, we have the mass of our body, so two great horned owls, but also think of that whole neck area as its own kind of turret, with the head spinning around on it. So this whole unit here can, can be, is, is another sort of structural thing to, to keep in mind. The whole head neck piece on owls can stick out as, as a very prominent zone. So you'll see that on you know, this uh, great gray owl, it's got a head up here, but then we have that whole head mounted on this big throat zone. The feathers along here are continuous all the way across. The feathers on the lower chest are in those two piles we talked about earlier. So feathers over here, feathers over here, zone in the middle that attaches to the head that sticks out. So when you're looking at owls, this is a very useful thing to look for, head mounted on its own little turret cone. That head can squinch down a little bit more, but often you'll see this as a really big element in play. Lower belly, two bumps up above that, here is our one section of our, our head. All right. You see that again here. Here's the head mounted on the turret, this big thick turret, and the breast below that in two sections. In flight, we see the degree to which we really have an impressive turret that that head is attached to. So, that getting that is going to be part of what make one thing that's going to make your owls look owly is that the head uh it's not like there's a small head and then there's a body there is a body that comes into this sort of thick stocky football player neck and the head is placed right in the middle of that underneath there there's a small skeleton a surprisingly small skeleton but the feathers on this thing really poof up a lot. But on the neck, most of the motion in the neck occurs here and here at two vertebrae. I was just reading a journal article about that this morning. Um, and two vertebrae are the major places where most of the motion in the neck is going to happen. And so these, uh, this, the result of that is that there's a, there's a big a, a very kind of functional unit there. Uh, if you're looking at the skull of the owl, what you'll see is that the eyes are, the eyes are actually really large and placed back in the head, but eyes are stuck out on big tubes that bring the eyes to the front. So that they have two large forward facing eyes. And the eye is actually much bigger than you would imagine looking on the outside of the owl. Um, inside the head, most of this skull is made up with eyes. So when I am looking at the owl, the first thing I wanna do is orient myself with my crosshairs through the eyes, down the middle of the head. I want this eye to be parallel with this eye. If the owl turns its head to a different angle, 
those are that crosshair is still going to be really functional with me. So those crosshairs change with the angle that the bird is holding its head. Here we see that the crosshairs, and look, you can even see, look at that line going all the way down here. So the face of the owl looks like a big dish here. This is a great gray owl that has this wonderful dish face. Owls have these large discs on the sides of their head to help focus sound to their ears back here. That kind of works like a large radar dish. There's a whole dish zone here, a whole dish zone here that's going to help concentrate more light into those, uh, <laughs> more light, more, um, more sound into those ears. So as, if it's looking at you from the front, those crosshairs are going to help you work. Your big challenge is to get the head to be symmetrical where you want this side to look like this side. Oh, one thing to notice about asymmetry here is like, check this out. Look at this pupil and this pupil. This pupil and this pupil. If you came up on a human being um, after an accident and you saw this, you would suspect a head injury. But on the owls, there pupils will dilate independently depending on this one's in more light and it's smaller. This one is in slightly darker conditions in the shade here and it's larger. That's kind of cool. All right. Let's turn the head. Here I'm seeing a half dish. Here my dish is foreshortened away from me. The other thing I want to notice here is that in this angle, I can clearly see this large triangle in the upper forehead. In a moment, we're gonna see that's gonna be really helpful in drawing all my owls. So I have this upper forehead triangle that fits into this facial disc. I'm gonna go to my document camera. Again, and, and we're going to come back to this guy. What I'm going to do is give this facial discs. So now I have here's my little owl head, and if you um, let's see, I'll, I'll turn it this angle, and you can s oh, there you go. You can see that. I've pushed these parts in at an angle. So there's a central ridge with a triangle at the top. And my two eyes. So as I wrote, when it looks straight up at you, the two sides are symmetrical. As I rotate it, that I first notice that the position of the eye on the far side gets closer to the center line. See that? Now notice that the side that is turning away from you, the size of that disc becomes less round and smaller. And lastly, notice that on this big triangle forehead zone up here, as I turn it, 
you're still going to see this far side will get a little bit smaller, but you're still going to see a lot of, see that big triangle forehead? The far side is a little bit smaller, but I've completely lost the far side here, and I'm still seeing a big portion of that triangle forehead. Because this surface is turned away from me more. So I'm going to have my big triangle forehead, and I'm going to be turning one side away from you. I'm still going to see some triangle forehead, uh, even on the far side. So the 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 shape change the curving back is not on the forehead right it is on where the facial disc is so i rotate it i rotate it and that far facial disc can disappear completely or i see it a little bit with the eye close to the center line. And notice I'm still seeing a lot of the triangle on my forehead. Thank you to Amelia for the use of her clay. Go back to the screen share. Let's look at some alley heads with that in mind. Just a heads up, we have about 18 minutes left, so we could start to wrap up in about eight minutes. All right. <clears throat> so here we go. Big triangle forehead. All right. In the past, I've been scooping this whole side of the head, and I missed that big triangle forehead thing. And now that I've been including this, my owls have been looking a lot better. Look at how this eye, we're really not even seeing the eye here, um, but where it would be closer to that center line. And then this side here getting straighter and narrower. Right? Your brain is going to want to keep you dishing this out. Fight that temptation. Right. Right. So from the front on this boreal owl, right, here is that crosshairs right through the center. And if the boreal owl turns its head, Look at this nice triangle, still very visible here. This eye has come closer to the center line. This dish has gotten straighter, and the distance between here and here is shorter than out here. So it comes in, straighter edge, and we are getting in this, this, this eye, we're barely seeing the eye. Isn't that cool? All right, so that's going to, getting that in the triangle will really help your owl heads. These photographs that we've been using throughout this talk, by the way, have all come from two websites. Um, and those websites have the photography of uh, two uh, great uh, bird photographers, Ashok Kosla and Vivek Kanzode. And the websites are seeingbirds.com and birdpixel.com. And these two art, uh, photographers have invited all of us to use all of their stuff as, as photo reference for the material um, for, for our, our practice and our work. So I want to encourage everybody to check out those two websites. Um, it's a tr tremendous high resolution photography that um, they're making accessible to all of us nature artists. So uh, greatly uh, appreciative of that. All right. So when I'm drawing, I, and the bird turns its head, I have my forehead triangle. I have, we've talked about the dynamics of what happens with the shapes on this side. You turn more, you lose the eye. Um, but 
I'm going to just do a kind of walk through with this Western screech owl and this great horned owl of how I might kind of go about blocking these in. Um, I will put these up as step by steps on my website uh, that you can stop and pause and kind of look at at different uh, steps if you want. So that's johnmuirlaws.com. You can also find on that site lots of more resources to help you draw um, birds and plants and things. You also will find more online tutorials and Zoom meetings to help you with your nature drawing. This afternoon at 12 o'clock Pacific time, for instance, I'm drawing a class, doing a class on how to draw trees. Um, so you can check that out for more resources, tutorials, um, and I also have a bookstore where you can get the, the other um, books that I make. And if you are able to make donations, you can, all do, you can do that all um, on that site. Um, we are probably going to have more of these workshops with the National Audubon Society. These have been a lot of fun for both of us. And um, so we're going to um, so also kind of watch Audubon or my website for more announcements of, of, of how to do this. And lastly, if you want to share some of your, your work, we have two wonderful ways of sharing it. One is the hashtag, hashtag DrawBirds2020, DrawBirds2020, and that will, um, you'll be able to, to find there uh, all the artwork that's been done by other um, owl sketchers. And also the Nature Journal Club is a Facebook page where a lot of people have been posting drawings of birds and, and other nature things that they've been doing. It's, you'll find a lot of people with a real naturalist sensibility there. So it's not an art contest. It is, uh, check out this cool observation that I made, and you'll get lots of ideas for your own nature drawing right there. So uh, just a time check, Hamar, how many minutes do I have? We have 12 minutes. 12 minutes. So in this 12 minutes, what I wanna do is I wanna take these two owls, and I'll walk you through how I, I would kind of frame them out and then put details on top of them. And you're going to see that the strategies in the two, there are some very, very similar things. All right, so I'm gonna start with just an owl head in both of these. So here's an owl head. And I suggest either pick the great horned owl or the Western screech owl if you wanna follow along with this, or you can just sort of watch and enjoy and later go to my website to where you'll be able to linger on the illustrations for as, as, as long as you want. I'm right? sorry, John, just to clarify, it's uh, about 11 minutes till the end of the hour. Okay, excellent. So here are my crosshairs. Right, so I see that this owl is looking this way, this owl is looking this way. And then I put in the V on the forehead. This is my new secret weapon in owl drawings. It really helps orient me and helps, the, helps that kind of turn of the head. And a lot of the other features are just going to fall into place based on the location of the V. I do it flat across the bottom and uh, that's gonna be above the bill and then up on either side. And from there, I'm putting in my eyes. Here, these eyes are, I've got two eyes. Here, I'm missing an eye on this side because the head has turned so much. Then, I block in the approximate location of where my beak is gonna go. And I just make a check mark, curve down. Now, beaks on owls are kind of flush with the, they're gonna be kind of sticking down more and hidden by a lot of feathers. So you'll see, but you'll just sort of see the central seam of those sticking down and notice how significantly below the eye we're seeing those. Then that facial disc, 
curving from the V, curving down and up. So curving down around the side of the head, making this one smaller. And then everything else. Okay, that's a big jump, I know. But here's what we did. Um, I've added a little ball of bristly feathers at the base of the bill. Same thing here. Bristly feathers around the base of the bill. I have my bird's throat here, sticking out my bird's throat here. And if your owl has feather tufts, I'm looking at where those occur on the top of the head, not worrying about their shapes, but just about roughly where they go. Very often looking at the negative shape between two feather tufts will help you get those into place. Once you've got those pieces, you can start drawing your eyes and things on top of them. So I pay a lot of attention to the shapes of the eye itself. Expect this eye to be a different shape than this eye. On this one over here, owls that have been surprised by a photographer often have very, 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 very wide eyes, and then they chill out a little bit. So depending on how wide-eyed you make your owl, you're gonna get a lot of different owly expressions. Very often you'll see the lid coming down and t crossing over part of that pupil. But they have a very prominent upper eyelid and lower eyelid. So as you are drawing in your owl eyes, wrap that upper eyelid around the eye. Think of the eye as a round thing. Instead of coming straight across with it, you're wrapping it around a round eye and draw those as curves, and then give yourself some upper eyelid that still allows you to wrap around. That's gonna really help your little owl. I have not very much beak sticking out. A line curving down, give it a sharp tick, tick and back. Line curving down, little sharp tip and back. And that is about the uh, all the beak that you're going to see. From there, I put in my big triangles, right? my big triangle. And that really helps pull the whole, at this point, it starts to feel like an owl to me, where I have that big forehead, that big triangle forehead, and then you're going to hang the facial discs off of that triangle. So give it the triangle and then, oh, <laughs> we're not doing that yet. Here, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna put some bristles around the edge of the beak of the bill, right? Long bristles getting shorter in here. Don't draw a bristle, bristle, bristle through the whole thing. Give it kind of a shaggy edge and then just a hint that there's some smaller bristles back in here you want these to be sort of pale. And I think about now, we're ready for drawing in our facial disc. There we go. The outside edge of it often has darker, stiff feathers with a lot of melanin in them that help hold the, uh, the melanin is a strengthener in feathers. And so it helps hold this disc out. So we often see these very nice dark trim around those facial discs. This one, more space here, this one closer. In filling in the rest of the owl, all right, I'm giving it ear tufts sloping back. These ear tufts can be, they're actually not ears, they're feathers and they can be smoothed down. They can also be held erect. So you'll get a lot of expression in your owl. Make sure to give your owl enough head behind the facial disc. There's a, the, the, all of this is in the front of the face. And then there's a big blank zone back here. And that is, um, that is going to be, you want room for the rest of the head. Right. So once you have those features in, you can start to kind of contour in and put 
other um, details and things in, and I'll go kind of quickly through dropping in just a bit of color in this. But this is essentially the owl drawing. It was built on this framework. So if you spend a little bit more time blocking in that framework, then your owls are going to start to, they, they, you give your details a place to go. My approach is usually to draw in my shadows first because it helps me think about these things three-dimensionally. Um, a good way to understand shadows is do a search online for photographs of albino owls, albino any species. You can that will help you think about how shadows are going to appear on the heads. Once you get all those patterns in there, it's really hard to think about. Anytime you're doing a drawing of a bird, see if somebody's found an albino on, and look for that online. If they do find them, they usually photograph them and they share it. It'll help you think about how all those, those, those parts are going to overlap. So I'll draw in my shadows. And if I'm doing watercolor, I put the watercolor shadows on first, let those dry and then you can start to build up color. With dark markings, I put the dark darks in last. So I get my colors basically there, and then I put darks in. And I usually think of my darks in two directions. The verticals, and I'll put those in, and then the crossbars on them usually smaller crossbars. So think of those as two different steps. Otherwise you get lost in the feathers, the major verticals and then the crossbars. Um, so major verticals, then crossbars. The eyes are wonderfully bright. You can have different size pupils if you want to. Very often you'll see a shadow cast across the eye itself. The shadow of the eyelid cast on the back wall of the iris there. So look for that. You see that right over here on this one that's in the sun. And the final step, if you put a little highlight into those eyes, they really pop. If you work on toned paper, which I often do, you can use white gouache or white colored pencils to add in whites. Otherwise, you know, you've got a solid drawing here, but if you have a, uh, using white toned paper, it's really fun just to get in there and you'll see at this stage, you get a lot of a pop. And that is adding a little bit of uh, color and details to those structured owl heads. Again, I'll have this available for you soon on johnmirlaws.com and let's see where is okay. that's a bunch of tricks on drawing raptors hawks eagles owls again it's a numbers game give yourself some practice ones the first few drawings you're going to do they're going to turn out funky they guaranteed will turn out funky and that's not because you're doing something wrong. It's because you need more time just playing with a subject in order to start to see it, to start to understand it, and also start to just warm up your eye-hand coordination. So put in some of what we call the sacrificial pancakes, those first, you know, the first pancakes that come off the griddle, they don't work. Same is true with drawings. Give yourself some sacrificial pancake drawings, and then you'll find that the ones that come after that, they'll start to come a little bit more easily. If you spend too much time drawing, 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 get up, walk around, get some exercise, play with the dog, play with your children, um, make a pot of tea, come back to it, shake out your shoulders, try a few more sacrificial pancakes, and then you'll get into it again. This really is something that you can do. Drawing is not a gift that some people have and some people don't have. It's a skill that you'll develop by doing it again and again and again, Throw yourself into making drawings this year. And by the end of this year, you're gonna see a massive change in your ability to render what you see. Incorporate this into your drawings and you will 
I'm sorry, incorporate this into your birding and you'll become a better birder. And lastly, as you're going out celebrating biodiversity and nature and birds around us, let yourself fall in love with those amazing animals and consider joining your local chapter of the Audubon Society where you can learn a lot more about all of these species, connect with a community of, of people who are also celebrating these animals and also doing important, incredible stewardship work to help protect these animals and the habitats that they live in. As a community of stewards, we can do a lot more than ourselves individually. And um, I think you will have a wonderful time sort of meeting those, um, those, those like-minded birdie people in your area. I hope that this workshop was of use to you and that you had some fun doing it. My name is John Muir Laws and thank you for joining me and the National Audubon Society today. Thank you so much, John. And we're out of time, but um, as a reminder to everyone, please, if you can support John and Audubon Society, we're putting on these workshops for free. Um, and we look forward to announcing more drawing classes soon. Stay tuned for that. Um, one last thing, John, people are asking for their homework assignment. Oh, that, thank you. <laughs> All right. So your homework assignment is, um, first of all, if you can get your hands on clay, get some hands on, your hands on some clay and make a little owl head and play with that. Um, if you don't have clay, you can make some bread dough, right? And make a bread dough owl head and then make some bread. Um, and what I want you to do for, for homework is, um, is, is to try to play with subs that are turning at different angles. So raptors that, you know, yeah, do some from the side, you can do some from the front, right? But once, you can come with that, start to mess with just turning that head a little bit. Maybe that's just, you know, bringing a little bit of head on the other side of the beak. So you see a little bit of this side of the head on the other side of the beak start to just turn those bodies a little bit and, and see what you can do. If you start to mess with an owl, there's really fun eye shapes that you'll find on the other side and the angles that you get on those facial discs are really, really a delight to, to, to play with. Um, and what I would like is, and these can be drawings that, um, these can be drawings that just take uh, you know, a minute. This could be a gesture sketch, um, or it could be a more kind of careful, detailed one. Um, but I'd like everybody to do 10 drawings. No, 11. Oof. Right. Look, give me 11. Give me 11. Th this one. This one goes to 11, right? So, uh, <laughs> so 11 drawings of, of, of birds. And, and, and again, if you're thinking that feels like too much, these can, these can, some of these can be just one minute drawings, right? But on some of them, just start to kind of get into these things, start turning things around different angles, play with those raptors. And then the next time you're out in the field and there's an owl or a hawk sitting in the tree, you'll be like, I, I, I know what to do here. I got this, I got this. Try some from the back, right? Check out my scapulars. Check out my scapulars. Right? Get the, those 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 birds. Have some fun with it. Right? You can do this, and um, that's your homework for today. Wonderful. And with that, we're out of time. Please share your homework at hashtag DrawBirds2020. Hopefully, we'll see you all for the next class. Bye, everyone.